All right, we're going to talk about fatigue today some more. And what you have seen so far is a variety of fatigue where you have uh, what's a, a load scenario that is called a fully reversing load. It means that whatever stress you apply to the positive direction at a particular critical point in a material, you're also applying that same magnitude of stress in a compressive direction, um, and you're kind of oscillating between those two. And what the question we're going to answer today is how do you handle situations where it isn't loaded in that particular way, where it's a fully reversed load? What happens if you are uh, something other than fully re reversed? So uh, what, we're, what we'll start with here is a quick description here of various kinds of load that we might be able to see uh, happen on some materials. The one that I just talked about, fully reversing, that would be something like this, where if you look at a specimen, uh, for instance, like a, an axially loaded specimen like I have here, um, when you have that loaded uh, over time such that it is, has a variable load and it may create a stress in that thing that does something like this. Okay, and it's basically oscillating between two extremes, and you see these two extremes here being this endurance limit. And if this is the fully corrected endurance limit, then at least hypothetically, your part should never fail as long as this uh, profile of stress that's happening stays within those limits. Okay, so that's kind of one extreme is like you're, you're going from a particular stress uh, value in a tension direction and fully reversing it to a compressive direction. Second question, what if you had a purely static load? Like you just put a tensile load in a part like this, what level of stress fails it then? Okay, so this, this by the way, this is fully reversing. Okay, if you have just a static load in one direction, the, the answer to this is a little bit tricky. It's why some of you are probably going, I don't know which one. It, it's going to be one or the other of either a stress level up here at SUT, right? You get up to that level, it'll fracture, right? It doesn't matter if you have it oscillating anymore. It got up there and it broke, right? So that's kind of our old way of thinking about stress before we started thinking about the fact that stress can be variable over time. Right? Or if we wanted to find a failure as the material yielding, then we would say here at our yielding stress, it gets up to that level and we say then it has failed. Right? And it doesn't need any oscillation. Okay? Well, there's another possibility, and that is what if it oscillates uh, you know, some sort of a fluctuating load and it changes between two extremes that aren't either fully reversing or just some static load? Okay, so one example of that might be something that is known as a uh, repeated load. Okay, I'm going to do that in a uh, slightly different color here, more than slightly. Uh, if you have a repeated load, it might be something like this. You, you apply a force or a stress, and it comes down and, and is completely released. It goes up and comes down, and it touches zero again here, and so on and so forth. This is called a repeated load. What magnitude of repeated load would cause our material to fail? Okay. And a couple of possibilities could exist. It could be that it would go up to our endurance limit, and we're going back down to zero. It could go up to there, and any, any stress levels above that we would think that maybe over a certain number of cycles it might still fail, okay? But that's not what ma real materials tend to do if they are in a repeated loading scenario, okay? Um, this, is a, this is a real question. It's something that people, you know, had to kind of think about and try to figure out for the things that we know so far, uh, what stress levels would cause something to fail if we have uh, these you know, ranges of stress being applied cyclically over time that aren't fully reversing or just a static load, okay? And one of the uh, ways that, you know, it was, it was sort, of, sort of theorized and kind of uh, an understanding of it that was come up with at a certain point in time 
uh, can be described with the diagram I have over here, and this is basically called the Goodman criteria. Okay, and basically the this theory goes that if you take and actually let me describe this figure because this figure is is really neat and it really helps to describe uh, what's going on. If you are on this figure and you uh, let's say you are in a situation of fully reversing stress, right? On this figure, that means that you are at this location. And you can see what's going on there is that the mid-range of the stresses that we're applying is right here, and it ranges from going to negative S sub E and up to positive F sub E. And our uh, rotating bending test tells us that you know, as long as, uh, you know, that along with all of our correction factors that we've been dealing with, tell us what this stress level can be before we expect uh, the thing not to have infinite life anymore, okay? And we also see up here that the material will fail at some other point as well. Where along this, these curves, because basically the curves that you see here, um, this curve right here, this curve right here, describes stress levels where if you exceed what those stress levels are, uh, it's going to fail. So if you look at those, one way we can describe our repeated loading scenario is at the place where the minimum stress that is applied is right here at zero. And it would go up to this line and it go equally as far above that line to this other stress level. And this, uh, you know, kind of those two lengths right there give us the range in which it varies where the middle point is the mid-range in that setup. So, you know, that's a repeated load. This is also repeated on this diagram. And the Goodman criteria basically says, draw a straight line from your S sub E value on each end, draw straight lines from those two S sub E values out to a point here where you have S sub U and S sub U, and those two straight lines will describe the types of stress that would cause this material to go from having infinite life to less than infinite life. Okay, I know that's kind of a lot to take in. This is a, a hard diagram to kind of process mentally. Yeah, those are straight lines, and this, at least for this uh, method of understanding what stress levels would cause uh, it to stop having infinite life. And you see here, a little bit interesting thing, they are plotting a mid-range stress. That's what this 45 degree line is. The reason it's 45 degrees is that they are plotting it against mid-range stress, right? So if they plot mid-range stress against itself, it's gonna make a 45 degree line, right? And so for a particular mid-range stress, you can see that if you let the stress value vary up and down from that mid-range stress, if, that's, if that variance goes beyond a certain level, uh, then you can go outside of the range of the blue lines and you now predict less than infinite life if you're outside of those blue lines. Okay, I know there's a, a lot of you are really processing this. I can see the wheels turning in your, in your heads right now. Um, yeah, let, let's think about this. Let's say, what if I was plotting just X and Y and I wanted to plot the line Y equals X? Okay, and I want to plot that against X, all right? What shape does it make? It's a 45 degree line. That's exactly what we're doing here. We're taking our horizontal axis to be mid-range stress and we're plotting that same value of mid-range stress on the Y axis um, and that's what creates that middle line that goes up the middle, okay? And then from there, we're thinking about uh, sort of a range of variation off of the mid-range to the upper and lower ends of the actual stress that is being applied. And if you go outside a certain range, then that is going to predict that you, you're no longer going to have infinite life. Does that make sense? It's, I know this is a, a little bit of a difficult diagram to think about, but it's also very descriptive. So the, uh, the one that they actually put on here is more of a general case. Let me try to find a different color here. They used this case right here. They said, 
you know, there's a mid-range point right here. You go up and down from there and you figure out uh, if you have a mid-range that starts at that orange dot and you have an alternating component that goes outside of those blue lines, then you're going to start predicting that you don't have, uh, you won't have infinite life anymore. If I was going to plot the uh, kind of the shape of that curve on my axes over here for a wave as it pertains to time, what it would probably look like is something like this. Okay, and actually I'm gonna redo that a little bit. Let's say it looks something like this, because it's not necessarily going up all the way to the point of yield. Okay, so this is just sort of a general case. Okay, and you see there, they actually do plot on here, on the Goodman diagram, they plot where the uh, yielding point would be. See, this is where the material would yield. All right. And it's common for the Goodman criteria to, to chop off uh, one end of the failure criterion if you want to define yielding as being a failure, which is probably a good idea in most cases, especially for these fatigue type of things, because if you start causing yielding in one direction, it's likely it might yield again in the other direction. And if you have repeated yielding inside of your material, uh, it's unlikely it's going to be able to last. Okay, so it kind of chops off the end over here where you could end up having yielding. All right, so the, the big point that I want you to see out of this is that um, all of these cases of fatigue where we don't have either, say, purely uh, fully reversed loading or something like a repeated load or something, you know, some, some sort of special case, we need language to be able to describe uh, how bad are these states of stress as far as, you know, for the loading profile that they're actually put under. In other words, is it a bad thing for a material to, be, to have stress fully reversed? Or is it worse for it to have some sort of static level of stress, and off of that static level of stress, we have an alternating component that's also applied on top of that? And you know, how do, do all of those states of stress play into the possibility that your part could fail prematurely? Your part could fail um, you know, before it has reached an infinite number of cycles. Okay? So the language that we use for this is that we actually come up with these two terms that are called mid-range and alternating stress, okay? And their definitions might be exactly what you would think that they would be, okay? So the mid-range stress, which we generally call sigma sub m, mid-range stress is just the average of the extremes of the stress that might be applied. So you look at however the, the largest amount and then the smallest amount, you take the average of those. Okay, and if you have, uh, let's say that one of these values is negative, let's say your minimum value actually ends up being a negative, you go ahead and plug in a negative value there because what you're seeing is that um, your average your, or your mid-range stress for the case of fully reversing, for instance, your mid-range stress is zero, right? So, uh, and that tends to work there. So this is your mid-range stress, and if you know what the stress extremes are, the highest it gets and the lowest it gets, you can calculate for that mid-range stress, okay? The other element is alternating stress, okay? How do you think this is defined? Yeah, max minus min. Okay, and they actually put absolute value around that as well. All right. Um, so this is, these are the two components that we think about, and our first criteria for deciding when we think these things might no longer have infinite life um, is this, this one that's called good, the Goodman criteria. And this is one way of stating it over here, and I've sort of made some annotations on there and tried to make it look fairly realistic relative to uh, you know, a time-based wave of stress. A quick comment I should make before I move on to the next thing is that we don't really care very much uh, 
the actual profile of this. It doesn't have to be sinusoidal, for instance. Right? All we care about are the limits. We care about how high does it go, how low does it go. Right? And we're looking for that, those two values. All right? Well, let me show you an alternate expression of the Goodman criteria. Okay? And it's this uh, diagram that we have over here on the left. What we basically do here is we draw a straight line so that these two axes are ones we're going to use a lot. This is the mid-range stress, and this is the alternating stress. Okay, we're going to use this set of axes a lot to describe our different ways that things could be loaded. Yes, sir? Yes. No, it doesn't have to be. Uh, the, any, so, um, you know, any time it returns back to zero. So, I mean, I could have, you know, a wave that looked like this. That is a repeat, that's a evidence of a repeated stress, repeated load, right? So it doesn't, I'm not looking at the height of the curve. I'm looking at uh, the bottom of it, right? Where does it return back to? If it always returns back to zero stress for the minimum, that's considered a repeated load. And it, I mean, that should make kind of a little bit of sense to us. There are some cases where you apply a load to a, a part or a piece of material, and then you remove it. And you apply it again, and then you remove it, right? And the fact that you're completely removing it, that is what um, creates that, you know, condition of being a repeated load. General case, there are no criteria. And I'm just saying that there could be, you know, any old wave of stress where you have a non-zero uh, mid-range stress, you have some maximum stress, you have some minimum stress. That's just your general case that, you know, we can handle anything, including ones where we don't really give it a name, right? We just have a uh, stress profile that has a max and has a min, and w when we find those maxes and mins, we can figure out what the mid-range and alternating stress components are um, for, uh, for that stress profile over time. Does that make sense? All right, so I wanted to go back to this uh, chart right here and uh, talk about it a little bit. So what you see up here on the vertical axis is this is our fully corrected endurance limit. And over here, this is our ultimate strength. Okay, This line that's drawn right here if we are plotting mid-range stress and alternating stress, again, you know, the alternating stress against the mid-range stress, then this line here represents the same thing that I just showed over here, where instead it was represented as being just overall stress versus mid-range stress, right? The, the line that I'm showing you there represents the blue, or the, I'll show you it this way, the blue sections that I had over there are this portion. Sorry. This portion right here is the blue portion that I drew over here. Okay, let me get a different color even. Let me say I've got this section over here. All right, that section over there is described with this little line segment right here. What you're saying is that at some point, uh, your failure is not defined as much by the alternating component, right? The fact that this is a uh, fatigue scenario, it's defined just by the fact that in the very first cycle, you yielded your material, okay? And so these put together are generally known as the, the uh, modified Goodman approach, okay? Modified Goodman has some advantages. Uh, it is very simple. It's linear, okay? So it's this straight line that describes, um, or it's kind of two straight lines, I guess, because you are generally expected that you're going to evaluate whether or not it yields on the first cycle, right? And that's what that little light blue uh, section is down there. Um, the uh, only disadvantage it's got is that it, uh, it doesn't actually do the best job of representing experimental data. So we actually have some other ones that are out there that do a little bit better job of passing through the experimental data that we have that's available, okay? 
Um, I'm stopping short of saying that the Goodman approach is conservative because it is not. Actually, none of them that we are going to look at are truly conservative, okay? And so for that reason, the book actually tries to avoid talking about these as being failure criteria uh, because it's not that deterministic, right? It's, you, you can have failures, uh, even if you calculated and thought that everything was fine, you can still have a failure in some cases depending on uh, things like whether your material had any defects in it and what kind they were, and there's a lot of factors that go into that. So uh, what it does is it actually sets up a method for us to be able to do design and be reasonably confident that we have evaluated the suitability of a particular part to resist fatigue. Um, and as long as we apply a little bit of a factor of safety in there, we can kind of be fairly confident that we are not going to have parts that fail due to fatigue prior to us expecting that they would have. Okay. Um, one other little comment before I move on to our example, and that comment is, what about compressive behavior? Okay, so this is yet another way to express uh, the same idea. Actually, the, this over here is the thing that expresses the same idea, right? That's, that is also the Goodman criteria, but now they're doing it in terms of ratios of mid-range stress to ultimate stress and alternating stress to uh, endurance limit. So they're doing it all in terms of ratios on here. And what you see is you have some interesting behavior when you have compressive stress only, or not only, but if you have your mid-range stress being compressive, right? What starts to happen is that your mid-range component starts not to matter very much, all right? What matters? Excuse me, you're not, um, you know, it doesn't matter what your mid-range component is, right? And what matters mostly is just what your endurance limit is, all right? You see here, these are kind of centered all around. The part will tend to fail whenever your stress values uh, approach your endurance limit. Okay, so that's kind of an interesting bit of behavior. Our examples we do in this class are going to focus mostly on the range of this uh, curve that's over to the right, um, but I figured I'd mention how do these things behave once they are in compression, and actually you see here that they say that these two lines here are parallel, All right? That is another expression that basically says the same thing, that what matters here is your alternating component of stress, and if it's close to your endurance limit, when you have a compressive mid-range stress, then that's basically the only thing that matters. All right? All right, all right. Shall we do an example? All right, so this example here this is a form of a connecting rod. So what we have is a crank that is being turned, and as that crank turns, this connecting rod is responsible for raising and lowering a weight that is riding against an inclined plane. All right, and the reason I set this up is I want to give you a reasonable uh, situation where we could end up having uh, some general case of load magnitude in a part, okay? In a case like this where this uh, weight is riding against that inclined plane, and if this inclined plane is not frictionless, okay, then what you would see there is that uh, whenever the crank turns so that it was lifting this weight up, uh, it would have to both overcome gravity as well as the friction that happened between that weight and the surface it was riding against, okay? What about when it goes around and it starts lowering the weight? Okay, in that case, the direction that the friction acts is opposite the direction of the weight, right? The direction of, uh, that the weight would tend to try to make this uh, this thing move. 
right? And so what you see there is that you have additive effects in terms of how much load would have to be in the rod when it lifts, whereas on the way down, friction actually you know, reduces the amount of load that's going to be in that rod, okay? And you could imagine that just by shifting the angle of this inclined plane some, you could actually set that up to where you had uh, all positive values for load in the rod, right? Or you could have values that were, went both positive and negative, depending on what the angle was that this thing uh, was set up. Okay, so far so good? All I'm trying to do is give you a reasonable scenario that could end up making a part carry uh, a cyclic load such that you know, it was, it's not a repeated load, it's not a fully reversing load, it's some other arbitrary uh, kind of general case like we talked about a few minutes ago. Okay? And by having it set up this way, let's say that due to the magnitudes of things, and I don't want to try to go do that whole problem of figuring out what the magnitudes would be, I'm going to leave that for some really nice web work problems that you guys have to work. Um, but we will have a two kip maximum uh, tensile stress in this connecting rod when it is lifting the, uh, the weight. And when it is lowering the weight, that magnitude of load in the rod drops to 0.5 kips, okay, due to the fact that there's friction that's sort of uh, resisting how it would move as it goes down. All right, I've given you some geometry of this rod and how it's shaped. It's half inch thick. It's got a 0.3 inch diameter hole. That hole is set back from the tip of the piece by one inch. Okay, it's got a two inch width. This rod is made of 1018 cold drawn steel. Okay, and so for properties for that, we can go to table A20 in the back of the book and find that its ultimate strength is 64 KSI and its yielding strength is 54 KSI. We'll say that the surface is unmodified. What do you think I mean by that? Okay, so out of the cold rolling process to make this thing, uh, whatever, whatever the surface was like whenever it was done with that, that's still what the surface is like. Okay. Uh, we want it to be, we want this rod to be 90% reliable. What that means is that we do not want more than 10% of the uh, times that we try to set this up, we don't want more than 10% of them to fail at some point in time that is lower than an infinite number of cycles. Okay, so we want that 90% reliability. What we want to find is a factor of safety against fatigue, assuming infinite life, and using the Goodman criteria. I'll put that in here, for infinite life. Also along the way, what I want to do is come up with a separate factor of safety against first cycle yielding. All right. So what are we going to need to do for this problem? Let's talk through some of the steps. Okay, we are going to need to find a fully corrected endurance limit, S sub E. Okay, so that's one of the things we'll need to do. What else? There's going to be some stress concentration that happens. We can't ignore that. Even if it's a material, we can't ignore stress concentrations when we're in a fatigue type of a scenario. So for us to consider stress concentrations, that means we have to first find a theoretical stress concentration. We have to find a notch sensitivity and then apply that notch sensitivity uh, to be able to come up with a fatigue uh, stress concentration. Okay, what else? We are gonna need to find mid-range and alternating stress, okay? And those will be with that stress concentration applied, right? And then what else? Apply that into a formula for 
the uh, Goodman criteria and find a factor of safety, and then also find our yield. All right, the thing that I, I think what I'd like to start with here is the issue of the stress concentration. All right, good with you? All right. Okay, so for stress concentration, what I'm gonna do is move over here and show you that I've got a nice chart that is set up for a case like the one that we are working on. Okay, this is a pin through a hole. All right, and when you have a pin through a hole, the edges of the hole uh, experience uh, stress concentration due to that pin being in the hole. Okay, what are the parameters that we need here? Okay, we need H over W and we need D over W. So let's calculate these. H is how far back the hole is from the end of the rod. What was that for our case? That was one inch, right? What was W? For our rod, it was two inches wide. What was the diameter of our hole? 0.3 inches. Okay, so that tells us here that D over W is going to be equal to 0.3 inches over 2 inches, which gives us 0.15. Now, what's uh, H over W? Okay. H is one inch, W is two inches. Okay, so that means that we are on this curve right here, H over W equal 0.5. Okay, and so let me do this, I'll say 0.15 Read up to that curve right there. And I'm just going to call that 6.5. And this is K sub T. All right. So then what? All right, well, um, K sub T can be modified slightly to make K sub F based on our notch sensitivity. And I showed you all, I believe, last time that you could use the thing called the Nuber constant and calculate notch sensitivity and then use notch sensitivity uh, in our little equation to find K sub F. Let me show you another thing here. There's another chart, and this is figure 620 in your book, that gives you notch sensitivity as a function of notch radius and strength. Okay? Depending on how important it is that you get your answer to umpteen decimal places, right? Do you ever, are you ever in situations where you need your answer to umpteen decimal places? Yeah, so there's a, a few situations where you end up in that place. I'm sorry about that. That's just kind of uh, a, an unintended consequence of how we do certain types of uh, uh, you know, exercises and stuff for you all to work on. In real life, it wouldn't make that much difference if you were off by a, you know, a little bit at the end of an umpteen decimal place long uh, statement of a number, in which case it's probably okay to use a chart like this. right? And so what would our radius be? Our diameter was 0.3 inches, right? So the radius that we would be looking at would be equal to 0.15 inches. And so what we could do is read on here, and we're at about 0.15 inches, right about here. How strong is our material? What's our ultimate strength? Okay, 64 KSI. 
That's not far different from 60 KSI, which is this curve right here. 64 is a little bit more. So what do you want to call it? Good with me. All right. I would say probably close enough to say that we're at about 0.8. Okay, again, close enough is one of those things that depends on the application, right? I would recommend that for most of your web work and even for your exams and that kind of thing, go ahead and use the technique of t finding the Nuber constant, plugging it in to uh, the other equations, and that way you can get a more definitive value because that's how all of those things are coded, right? They don't need these figures? I would say for those applications, using these figures is probably uh, introducing a point of uncertainty that you do not need right? Um, because you know that it's coded internally inside of those exercises according to the finding the Nuber constant first and then finding Q, et cetera, okay? However, I didn't want to ignore the fact that this figure was in there and it's actually completely fine to use it um, in my estimation. All right, so Q is 0.8 and that means for our stress concentration we can find K sub F using equation 632. K sub F is going to be 1 plus Q, which we just found to be 0.8 or estimated to be 0.8 based on the chart. K sub T, which was 6.5 minus 1. Okay. And so based on this, I get that our K sub F value is going to end up being 5.4. Cool. Now what do you want to do? Okay, you want to find mid-range and alternating stress? Okay, I'm good with that. This was equation 632. All right, so mid range and alternating stress. This is a axial load, correct? So all we really need to do over for this is that we find stress, let me, I'll label this, say mid-range and alternating stress. Okay, our stress that we're going to have is basically just going to be force over area. Okay. And so what we'll do is we're, we're going to need some, some labels here that help us understand what we're talking about. Always when we're doing stress concentration, we usually find a, uh, a, a nominal stress first, and then we multiply it by a stress concentration to get a maximum. So we have one idea where we think of it being a maximum stress that way. We also have a maximum force and a minimum force, right? So we're almost having a max max. Right? So uh, that's probably how I will label it. Okay? So we'll say our maximum stress, uh, like max max, you know, this is as maximum as it gets, is equal to whatever the stress would be nominally, which would be two kips over the cross sectional area. What's the cross sectional area? Okay, 0.5 inches thick multiplied by, we want to take the portion of it where the area is minimum, right? So the portion of it where the area is minimum is where the hole is located. So you would end up having two inches minus the diameter of the hole. And all of this is going to be multiplied by K sub F. And K sub F is 
Okay, and so that gives me 12.706 KSI. Okay, now what about my minimum stress but accounting for my stress concentration? Well, it's really going to be the same thing, right? It's going to be 0.5 kips, though, as the force rather than 2 kips. And so if we put all of that in here, we get 3.176 KSI. Okay, but these are basically the min and max stresses that we would see on a stress profile versus time like if we saw the stress wave, right? This is our maximum value it gets to and the minimum value that it gets to. Now we need to figure out what are our mid-range and alternating stresses. Okay, so we just plug that into the equations that we have for that, which uh, are simply, they are equation 636. The mid-range stress is just going to be equal to 12.706 KSI plus 3.176 KSI over 2, which gives us 7.941 KSI. Okay. Also listed under equation 636 is our alternating stress value. And this gives us 4.765 KSI. Okay. We're only lacking one thing to be able to apply our equation for Goodman uh, factor of safety. By the way, the, the equation for Goodman factor of safety is 646 on page 314. And one of the variables we don't have yet for that equation is S sub E, which we identified a few minutes ago that we were going to need to do that. We just haven't done it yet. Okay, so let's get that last piece and then we will apply our equation for uh, the Goodman criteria. Questions yet before I slide this down? All right. So let's start with a surface factor. We're doing the Goodman criteria. Modified Goodman is what they call it in the book. Okay. Surface factor. This is a uh, rolled or, or drawn material. It's cold drawn. All right. So we, uh, we're going to go to that section and find the description that they have. And they say machined or cold drawn. All right. Factor A is 2.7 if we we're in units of KSI. Factor B is negative 0.265. Okay. 
So k sub a then for us is going to be equal to 2.7 times 64. That's our ultimate strength of the material raised to the negative 2.265. Uh, This is equation 619. Okay. And so K sub A ends up being 0.897. Okay, what about K sub B? That's our size factor. Okay, I'm going to point you to equation 621. K sub B is equal to 1 for axial loading. Okay, Their, their note in there says uh, k sub b, it says for axial loading there is no size effect, so k sub b equals 1, but c k sub c. Okay, loading factor. Loading factor says that if you're dealing with an axial load, you should use an, a loading factor of 0.85. Okay, and that is equation 626. All right, what else? Okay, temperature factor. Were we given any information about temperature? Okay, in those cases, if I give you a problem and I don't say anything about temperature, you don't have to assume that it's going to be in elevated temperatures. So you just say it's going to be a room temperature, K sub D equal 1. Okay. So what's next? KE, we want 90% reliable. Okay, we can look up based on 90% reliability, we can look up a reliability factor K sub B of 0 0.897. And nothing is said about any other effects that we need to account for with a miscellaneous effects factor either. Okay, so I feel like we've got all of our Marin factors now, and we should be able to solve for our fully corrected endurance limit. Okay, the full, fully corrected endurance limit, S sub E, is going to be equal to K sub A, 0.897, multiplied by K sub B is just 1, K sub C is 0.85, K sub D is just 1, and K sub E is 0 0.897. There is no real significance that those wound up being the same just in case anyone wants to think that, you should stop thinking that, okay? This is multiplied by the uncorrected endurance limit, which our estimate for that, if we don't have any other information about our material, our estimation for that is half of 0.895. 
ultimate strength. And once all of these factors are applied, we end up with a fully corrected endurance limit of 21.882 KSI. And we're getting close. Can you feel it? All right. Our last step is to apply the Goodman criteria. Okay. The Goodman criteria, the equation for that is again. Uh, six let me find it there it is 646 okay and what I'm going to do is actually just rearrange it a little bit from how it's stated in there. It gives, it gives us an expression that gives us the reciprocal of the factor of safety n. And so to find factor of safety n, I'm going to take the reciprocal of the stuff that's on the left side. So 1 over, okay, alternating stress. What was alternating stress? 4.765 KSI. Over fully corrected endurance limit, which we just found was 21.882 KSI. Plus mid range stress. And that was 7.941 KSI. Okay, over S sub UT, which is 64 KSI. Okay, and the factor of safety that we compute there uh, becomes 2.925. which is pretty good, okay? Um, one thing to remember is that we're, we're trying to design for infinite life, right? So roughly speaking, this is saying we could load almost three times as heavy and still have it last an infinite uh, life, okay? All right, so this is uh, our factor of safety against fatigue, uh, designing for infinite life. <clears throat> what about first cycle yielding? Okay. This is easier than you might think, uh, even though there's not necessarily a direct equation for it in here. Um, all you do is just remember that factor of safety, generally speaking, is uh, strength over stress. In other words, how much strength do you have divided by how much stress are you actually applying? Okay. And our worst case for stress is when? Yeah, it's when it's lifting the weight up, which is that max max that we had down there. It is, what was it, 12.706 KSI. Okay. So that means that goes in the denominator. What goes in the numerator? Yield strength, 54 KSI. 
So our, our uh, factor of safety against first cycle yielding will be 4.25. Questions yet? Yes. Yeah, if your min stress is zero, then that is a repeated load situation. You would be on this green line right here, right? Our, this technique that we just looked at works all the way to the point where you have a fully reversing load, which means that your minimum is going to be negative of whatever your maximum is, right? So it works all the way in there. And then the only difference once you go to where your mid-range stress becomes negative is that uh, your range is just set by what your uh, endurance strength is from that point on. Okay, I want to show you one last thing. I'm starting a, uh, a method of presenting this information, okay? This is your, probably your first time getting to see something like this. Uh, it has similarity to certain things that we did when we were looking at static failure criteria, okay? We are about to start thinking about uh, fatigue failure criteria, right? And so we just did the Goodman criteria here, and that is represented by this blue line. In other words, if your load line goes outside of that blue line, you start feeling less safe, right? And because it is not something that is inherently perfectly conservative, we're actually starting to feel unsafe even if our load line gets out to where it is near that line, right? It's, if we want to make sure we're safe, we want to sort of make sure we are not getting super close to that line, okay? So the red line you see right here is the load line. Uh, the blue line is the Goodman line, and then what you see with the orange dots up here, that's called the Langer line, and that just represents uh, the you know, stress levels at which your material will yield. Right? So what we're basically saying with this is that uh, we expect for fatigue to be the main problem if we have an alternating stress value that is at some level relative to our mid-range stress value, right? If it's higher, if we have higher alternating stresses, the slope of our load line will start to become more and more vertical, right? And we expect for fatigue to be the main problem. But if you have large amounts of mid-range stress with just a little bit of alternating stress, the problem could be first cycle yielding, okay? So these are both potential ways that it could fail and taking the two together is a good way to kind of come up with what this um, failure criteria says. All right, questions? What we will do next time is look at a couple of other failure criteria uh, that will do a better job of representing what the experimental data looks like. So it basically is going to put the curves that we put in here uh, match them up better to what the experimental data looks like. And I'll go ahead and tell you what they are, and we'll get to actually covering them next time. One of them is called the Gerber criterion. What it basically does is it takes a piece of a parabola and it fits it right there because it turns out that the, the experimental data actually lies above the line that is set up with uh, Goodman. And the other one is called the ASME elliptic criterion. And the ASME elliptic criterion does it a little differently because it's set up, as you might guess, as an ellipse, but it's an ellipse that dies out at yielding strength. And the big advantage of ASME elliptic criterion is it is supposed to give you a better uh, estimate for how the uh, failure criteria might work with that first cycle yielding also accounted for all in one, si one size fits all kind of a criteria. So is it less weight? Um, 
Honestly, there, there are some pluses and minuses to using these in various situations. It's not quite as deterministic uh, of a method of choosing which one you want to use as we had when we had that flow chart in the static failure criteria uh, section that we covered. Um, so more or less, I would actually say that uh, the thing that seems to set what is used, which of these is used, is more tradition more than anything else. It's, you know, you, in bearing design, you might, you know, you might use an ASME elliptic, whereas in weld design, you might use a Gerber. You know, it, it kind of, it will be an application kind of dependent thing as to which of these tends to control what is in common usage in those areas. Any other questions? Good deal. Well, then I will see you guys on Wednesday.